Hello, my name is John Newman from Physical Electronics, and I am going to talk today about three different options that are available on the VersaProbe 3 XPS instrument. The first option is ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy, or UPS. The second is low energy inverse photoemission spectroscopy, or LIPS. And the third is reflection electron energy loss spectroscopy, or REALS. These three techniques are all very, very surface sensitive, and they provide information on the electron band structure of materials. And thing, parameters such as valence band, work function, ionization energy, electron affinity, and the band gap can all be determined by these materials or a combination of these, or these techniques, I should say. Uh, reels can also provide some additional information on things like hydrogen content and chemical structure. So electron band theory. Uh, we have a diagram here that shows some different molecular orbitals for materials. First of all, we see the, in red is what res, is referred to as the valence band. And this is the band of, of electron orbitals that's present in any material, and that's where the electrons typically reside and are available for bonding to other materials. Now, there's another band of electron orbitals that is present referred to as the conduction band. It's a higher energy band of, uh, of orbitals, and at times the electrons from the valence band can be excited and jump up into this conduction band. And um, once the electrons are in that band, they're available to move about very freely and create electric current. Now, in a, in a metal sample or a conductor, the bands actually overlap, and so the electrons are available to freely move about and conduct electricity. Whereas in semiconductor materials or insulators, there's a, a gap in the energy between the valence band and the conduction band, uh, typically of a few EV to several EV. In insulators, this, um, this band gap is often several electron volts, and it's very difficult to excite electrons from the valence band into a conduction band. And that's why insulating materials are such good dielectrics. They don't conduct electricity because it's so difficult to get the electrons from the valence band up into the conduction band. Now, there are several parameters that, uh, that our customers are going to want to determine in, in these types of semiconductor materials primarily. Um, there are things like the electron affinity and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the conduction band. And there is also the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO, and the ionization energy from the valence band. And the dis there's also uh, a theoretical value in, in electronic band theory referred to as the Fermi level. And that's the, where the probability is 50-50 of finding an electron at a, at a given time. That's a theoretical value, but you can measure that value from, from there to the, veil, to the vacuum level, uh, and that's referred to as the work function. So it's these types of parameters that uh, our customers that are studying uh, these semiconductors and often organic semiconductors uh, need to find out to characterize their materials. By doping materials, for example, you can change the band gap, and so these are the types of things they need to know. The techniques of, of especially UPS and LIPS are used a lot for organic materials and uh, things like organic solar cells or perovskites are, are a big study nowadays or people are studying them, organic photodetectors, organic field emission transistors or, or OFETs. A lot of work is being done on OLEDs and that's because they're being uh, used in so many different types of applications today. Reels can provide some additional information on things like hydrogen content as well as carbon chemical states, and I'll show you some examples of those later on in the talk. The first technique, UPS. And this is a very, very surface sensitive technique where we're using a fixed energy of ultraviolet, ultraviolet light and bombarding a sample in ultra high vacuum, and we're looking at photoelectrons that are emitted. So it's essentially the same as XPS, but with just much, much lower energies. Phi's uh, ultraviolet source can be operated at two different energies, but most of the time it's run with the lower energy uh, helium-1 line at 21.2 eV. So it's like XPS, but we're using much lower energies and looking at lower energy uh, photoelectrons as well. 
Because UPS is so very surface sensitive, it's, it's very important to clean the samples to get the best results. So if you have a little bit of carbon on the surface, you're going to get poor results. And here's an example showing that. We have a, a silver foil that has some adventitious carbon that's on the outermost surface. And you see a, a very poorly defined secondary electron edge, as well as there's really no structure in the valence band out here from 0 to 5 EV as well. Whereas now if we sputter clean the sample, we see a much sharper onset of our secondary electron edge, and we see a lot more fine structure in the valence band. We found that it's very helpful to do Zillar rotation while you're sputtering, um, and of course that uh, is also looking at the same, uh, same location on the sample, the ion beam is, and so you can very easily rotate the sample and sputter it, uh, and then do the analysis. For organic materials, the GCIB is often used as it'll minimize the, uh, the damage that's done to the sample. Here's some examples of uh, UPS measurements that were done on a copper thiocyanate material. It's an organic uh, semiconductor that's used. We see a typical valence band spectrum on the left. Um, we see that there's an onset of energy, or, or onset of counts, I should say, at about 1.03 electron volts, and that's defining the highest occupied molecular orbital, or the HOMO. And using that information and seeing where the secondary electron edge cutoff is by biasing the sample, we can take the distance between the HOMO and that uh, secondary electron edge, subtract that from the energy of the incoming uh, UV photons, and that tells us what the ionization energy or the highest occupied molecular orbital is. In this case, on um, this uh, copper thiocyanide sample, it's measured as 5.12 electron volts. The next technique is LIPS, or Low Energy Inverse Photo Emission Spectroscopy. So this is one of the newest techniques that PHI now uh, offers, and it's, it's seeing a lot of interest in the market, especially for looking at these organic electronic materials. It's complementary to UPS, and again, in UPS, we're looking at valence band information and ionization energy. Um, but now in LIPS, we're providing information on the conduction band uh, that Gives, uh, give us, gives us the electron affinity or the LUMO energy level of that conduction band. LIPS uses very low energy electrons to bombard the sample to make sure that we don't do a lot of damage to organic materials. And then we're looking at very low energy photons that are emitted from that sample, typically in the UV or near UV range. In practice, what we're doing is we're keeping the energy of the electron beam bombarding the sample fixed, and then we're biasing the sample to adjust the energy of the incoming electrons hitting the sample. And then we're measuring the photon intensity versus that electron incident energy. There's another technique that's been available for a longer period of time referred to as inverse photoemission spectroscopy, but it doesn't use low energy. And there's a chart here that compares phi's low energy IPS to conventional IPES. And there's four different parameters shown on the left here. And the first is the measurement sample of, uh, measurement position of the sample. And on the LIPS, it's integrated into the instrument. And so we can look at the exact same uh, position on the sample using XPS or UPS or LIPS or reels. Or we can sputter it with an argon beam or GCIB or a C60 beam. Whereas in conventional IPES, it's not in integrated into the vacuum chamber, and so it has to be in a separate chamber, which means that you would have to transfer the sample uh, between the chambers to use multiple techniques. And then you always have to worry about whether or not you're really looking at the exact same area or not. The second parameter is the energy of the primary beam striking the surface. In LIPS, we're using 5 EV or less, whereas in conventional IPES, we're looking at 10 EV typically. So there's much more damage to organic materials using that technique. The photon energy selection is much easier in the LIPS because you can change out the bandpass filters in the air and you don't have to do it in vacuum as you do in conventional IPES. In fact, it's, uh, it's seldom done in IPES because it is in vacuum and very difficult to change that filter. The energy resolution is also shown in this table. It's about 0.45 EV or less with LIPS, 
and it's about 0.6 EV roughly with conventional IPES. FI does sell both LIPES and conventional IPES, so for customers that need to look at higher energy um, uh, photons where there's a higher electron affinity, we also offer the traditional IPES. Here's a schematic of the low energy IPES uh, where it's, it's relatively simple. We have an electron gun that bombards the sample surface and that's simply the barium oxide electron neutralizer that we use for XPS neutralization. And then we're collecting the photons that are emitted with an optical lens that goes through the bell jar and uh, then we have the bandpass filter and we can change those filters in air very easily and then the light goes into the photomultiplier detector. Here we have examples of the damage that can occur on an organic material with LIPES versus traditional or conventional IPES. On the left we see the LIPES experiment and this was a one to two hour experiment of collecting data on a C60 thin film and you see a normal type of photon emission from the material. You see a peak at roughly a little bit less than 3 eV electron energy whereas now on the conventional IPES we see that that same peak is greatly reduced intensity after only 10 minutes of irradiation at 10 eV and even greater reduction in that peak after an hour of irradiation. And so you can easily see that the LIPS is much more uh, gentle on organic materials than the conventional technique. As I mentioned earlier, we can, mention, we can measure the electron affinity of materials using LIPS and we simply use different bandpass filters and we plot the intensity obtained using different bandpass filters versus the kinetic energy of the incoming electron beam. And we can plot the, the onset of the emission uh, versus kinetic energy versus the bandpass filter energy. And we see that we get a linear line that is, extrapolates down to zero onset energy. And that's the electron affinity of the material. So very easy to calculate. And that electron affinity is the same energy as the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO. Now, once we combine the UPS with the LIPS, we can get a complete picture of the structure of the molecular orbitals on the materials such as this. Um, let's see, this was done on a thiocyanide, copper thiocyanide thin film. The UPS provides the ionization potential, while the LIPS provides the electron affinity. Taking the difference between those two values, we can easily determine the band gap of the material. So we get the complete structure or complete picture of what's going on on the uh, molecular orbital of these material. And here's just an example showing three different materials that are commonly used for OLEDs. And the electron affinity and the ionization energy have been determined by the combination of UPS and LIPS and then you can simply uh, subtract the two and determine the band gap for the materials. A layout of what the hardware looks like for LIPS. Again, we're using the barium oxide neutralizer as the incoming electron source. And here's what the detector looks like where the optic lens is inside the vacuum and outside the vacuum we have where you change the optical filters. So very easy, uh, easy addition to the system. mentioned earlier that the electron gun is simply the barium oxide neutralizer as shown here, so a very small part. And the UV detector is simply a combination of using a high band pass filter, a high pass filter, and a low pass filter. Combining the two allows a passive photon energy and by using different filter materials you can change the energy of the UV light that you detect. And we have five different detectors that are available for customers to use. The final technique I'll talk about is reels. And this is again a, a relatively surface sensitive technique, not quite as much as LIPS and, and UPS. But here we're bombarding a sample with an electron beam, typically at 1 kV or less. And we're looking at the distribution of the reflected electrons uh, and their intensity versus energy. Now looking at that distribution, we can get information on discrete losses of energy from that backscattered electron. 
due to things like excited atomic states or the valence band transitions that are occurring and get information on the band gap of the material. We can also use it to get information on the type and geometric structure of compounds at the surface of the sample. In the upper left, we see a counts versus kinetic energy of the emitted electrons during the Reels experiment. We have the secondary electron peak at the lower energies, and at the right, we have our backscattered electron peak. And it's typically looking at the backscattered peak and a few or several electron volts from that peak where we're getting information on things like the band gap and hydrogen um, and things like that. In reels, you can uh, do reels two different ways on the VersaProbe 3. One is if you have the Auger option, you can simply use the Lab 6 filament from the Auger gun as your source of energy in the reels experiment. If you don't have the Auger option, you, there's a newly developed low-cost electron gun with a tungsten source that's also available. Here's a, on the left, we have a um, counts versus kinetic energy, electron kinetic energy plot. We see the, the huge backscattered peak at, in this case, uh, a little above 200 electron volts that we used. And on, in this example, we're looking at a thin film SiO2 on silicon, which is a heavy insulator that's going to have a large band gap. And look, zooming in on this uh, low intensity region around 200 electron volts, you can see that from the backscattered peak out to about 9 electron volts, there's very little photoelectron emission, or, or just electron emission, I should say. And then at, at after 9 electron volts, you see a higher intensity of your background. And this distance, when that starts to your backscattered peak, is referred to as the band gap. And uh, for SiO2, it's a large band gap material I mentioned, and theoretical value is 9 electron volts. And so you can see we, uh, we were very close to that value in this experiment. Looking at chemical states with reels, on the left we see a spectrum of graphite versus diamond. And graphite has sp2 bonding where you have a pi to pi star shakeup that's easily determined or e easily detected, just a few electron volts lower energy from the backscatter peak. Whereas in diamond, you have a different type of hybridization going on, sp3, and so you don't have that pi to pi star shakeup that you see in the graphite. So you can easily determine the difference between the sp2 and sp3 bonding. On the right, we have some analysis of some polymer samples. And we have polyethylene terephthalate, polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE, and polystyrene. And looking just a few electron volts or a couple electron volts from the backscatter peak, we see some energy loss structure for polystyrene and for PET that we don't see for PTFE. And that's due to the hydrogen that's present in PET and polystyrene, whereas you don't have that in PTFE because all the hydrogens are replaced with fluorine. You also see some loss structure out about, uh, I guess it's six or seven electron volts from the backscatter peak for polystyrene and PET, characteristic of the pi to pi star shakeup aromaticity of the sample. You don't see that uh, intense peak for the PTFE because there is no aromaticity in that material. So you can get some structural information or hydrogen content information from reels as well. Looking out about 300 electron volts from the backscatter peak, you can also see some carbon spectra or carbon loss spectra and you can see that the, the four different materials that we analyzed, a, D, a DLC or diamond-like carbon on a, the inside of a polyethylene terephthalate bottle versus DLC on a hard disk coating, computer hard disk, versus diamond versus graphite, you see dramatically different spectra for the four different types of materials. And so you can characterize your materials very easily using reels. And the final diagram simply shows having a combination of XPS, UPS, LIPS, and reels all on the same analyzer or the same uh, setup on the VersaProbe 3, all looking at the exact same area on the sample surface, along with any sputter guns that you have on the sample. So you can very easily do combined experiments with these different techniques, all in the same area of interest. And with that, we'll end. Thank you very much.